Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. It's been four years since Kim Jong-un came to power in North Korea after the death of his father in 2011. To assess how the comparatively young and inexperienced leader has been doing so far, we had the pleasure of meeting with Andrei Lankov, the guest of our first episode. We spoke about Kim Jong-un's approach to the North Korean economy, the country's relationship with China, the impact and value of the international community's sanctions, and whether North Korea has become more stable ever since it is in the hands of Kim Jong-un. Andrei Lankov is professor of Korean studies at Gukmin University. He received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Leningrad State University and has also attended Pyongyang's Kim Il-sung University. He has published books in English and Russian and contributes to various news outlets, including the Korea Times and the Al Jazeera. Professor Andrei Lankov, welcome back to Korea and the World. Uh, hello, thank you for inviting me. It has been almost four years since Kim Jong-un came to power in early 2012. At the time, you wrote an academic article that said, and I quote, in the short run, one should not expect any significant change in Pyongyang. Do you think your prediction has held true so far? No, it was not. Uh, because back then, it did look plausible that Kim Jong-un would for a while continue his father's policy with little or no changes. Indeed, he was young, inexperienced, and surrounded by his father's old guard. However, I underestimated his decisiveness, uh, the toughness of his character. It does not necessarily mean that these are good features, but these features definitely exist. Therefore, changes which I expected as far as I remember in that article, I predicted the changes would start roughly in four or five years' time. These changes began much earlier, pretty much immediately after his ascension to power in 2012. So North Korea now is not dramatically different from what it used to be, but it's more different than I would expect four years ago. So what have the past four years taught us about Kim Jong-un's leadership style? Uh, first of all, like his father, he is a micromanager, somebody who is probably willing to deal with details, maybe less so than his father, but still. But what is important, he is impulsive, decisive, brutal, smart person. He definitely lacks experience, and some of his actions look rather difficult to explain. Nonetheless, so far, I would estimate his policies well. What is the most important? First, he began to do what his father should be doing since the late 1990s. He began to gradually dismantle the anachronistic and comically inefficient system of the state-run agriculture. Uh, we have a system of family responsibility, quite similar to what China used to have in the late 1970s, albeit less radical. Now, North Korean farmers work for a share of harvest. Roughly one third of what they harvest is theirs. And as a result, they work much better. People did not probably notice, but the last three years have been marked by good or very good harvests. And the only reason is a new system of incentives. Much harder working farmers. Second, he essentially decided to take a position of, should we say, benevolent neglect in regard to the private economic activity, which is quite advanced in North Korea. His father was less certain. There were periods under his father, Kim Jong-il, when um, private economy was tolerated. There were short periods when it was encouraged. And there were periods when the government did what it could to get rid of the private economy. Kim Jong-un is different. His position is simple. Officially, he does not admit that such economy exists. In real life, he has instructed his officials not to pay any attention to its existence and basically let the North Korean businesses continue, so to say, business as usual, to make money, 
to invest this money with a great deal of freedom, say for the construction business. Now we see a boom in housing, in construction of the private houses, apartment buildings in North Korea, not only in Pyongyang, across the country. And most of these buildings are built by private entrepreneurs for sale. Essentially, it's a market adventure, it's a capitalist enterprise. And according to rumors, repeated by many people in different situations and generally quite plausible, Kim Jong-un instructed not to ask questions about the origin of the money. As long as somebody has money and is willing to invest this money into a particular housing project, well, this person is welcome and nobody asks how did he manage to get quarter million or half million US dollars. And we are talking good money, seriously large money, because uh, the most expensive apartments in Pyongyang probably would cost you about 200,000 US dollars. It's exceptional, it's very high price. The average apartment would be probably 70, 80,000. Still not cheap. What does Kim Jong-un actually get out of that benevolent negligence? Economic growth he gets. Our North Korean economy has improved. The living standards have increased significantly. Sometimes you can see claims uh, that the improvement of the living standards have happened only in Pyongyang. No. I just actually, as a matter of fact, came from North Korea, from a countryside, from a large countryside town, and it was quite clear that the situation there improved significantly compared to what it used to be a few years ago. People are better dressed, a bit of traffic on the street, some new buildings, including large buildings, and a great deal of construction going on, and the general sense is of improvement. And I'm talking about the countryside. The same things in Pyongyang, well, you see it everywhere. Uh, So he got economic growth. He probably understands that there is only way to make economy growing. That is to introduce a bit of market, a bit of capitalism. It's the only game in town. I don't think he feels much upset about it. Like all his generation, he is probably quite non-ideological and definitely not serious about this official communist, uh, Marxist, Chuchi, blah, blah, blah. His paid propagandists are producing in unbelievable quantities on daily basis. Uh, he doesn't take it seriously, like all people around him. So he understands that if he is kind of permissive in dealing with the markets, he is likely to have economic growth. And he sincerely wants his people to live better. And he also understands that if they live better, they are likely to be more, well, supportive of his government. So it's his own vested interest and his kind of altruistic concerns, everything pushes him into the direction of more permissive, more liberal attitude to the economic growth. When we spoke to you over a year ago, you mentioned that the government had started the process of having its state industries transformed into private companies. Is that still happening? Yes, of course. Even though I would probably change wording, I would say that the government tend to turn blind eye when some of the technically state-owned enterprises are taken over by the private entrepreneurs. It keeps happening, and the more money, the more capital we have inside North Korea, the more likely this is to happen. Because people who now have, you know, operational capital in the tune of, say, quarter million US dollars, they are looking for in some kind of industrial investment. They are looking for ways to essentially buy some kind of workshop, some small factory, and start producing stuff for sale, either for export to China or for the domestic sale. And this is increasingly common. The problem is that usually, unless you are an insider, you cannot easily distinguish between a real, authentic, state-owned enterprise and a private enterprise. Because on paper, all enterprises are still state-owned. But in practice, many of smaller enterprises, especially producing products which are in high demand, are really private investment, private operations. In the early 90s, there are frequent reports that workers would just stay in factories, empty factories doing no work. Is that still the case today? Yes, but much less so. It's another change which happened under Kim Jong-un. I'm not sure whether it was a kind of the government decision 
or just government's unwillingness to enforce earlier regulations. I don't know. But what is clear, the government now, in the last, say, two, three years, is much less inclined to demand that workers would come and spend at least few hours every day at factories which are not operational anymore. This kind of attendance demands have sort of disappeared. Uh, workers still expected to show up occasionally, maybe a couple of times a week, but nobody expects them to spend their entire work day, or at least half of their work day. It's an assumption that uh, workers would basically search for paid work elsewhere. At the same time, as the factories, where people produce something which is in demand, which can be sold, and which is sold. In such places, uh, the salaries are much higher than it has ever been the case. If you are talking about such factories, like, say, it's largely mining, it's uh, food processing, it's cosmetics, uh, general consumption goods, but largely mining, of course, and sometimes, as a matter of fact, steel production, too. Uh, because they sell steel to China and there is some domestic demand, small but growing for steel, because of the special revival of the economy. Uh, so in these places, if you are a young and experienced worker, you probably would be paid about, say, 100,000, 150,000 North Korean won, uh, which is roughly equivalent of 15 to 20 US dollars a month. Doesn't sound large, indeed, but the official salary is 50 cents. And there is a big difference between 50 cents and $15. And we are talking about unskilled, inexperienced labor. Uh, salaries go up significantly, and a skilled worker can make maybe up to half million North Korean won, which is, well, roughly 60 US dollars. And if you have sort of rare skills, like a good miner or a good steel worker, you can make even more. So a worker who does regular job, who goes to a state-owned factory or factory which is privately owned but sort of disguised as a state-owned, such a person can sometimes make up to 100 US dollars a month, which is, which is good. And this is a new situation uh, which actually emerged under Kim Jong-un. It's another change because these enterprises are now paying real money very small by the standards of the outside world, but sufficient for physical survival in the conditions of North Korea. How are the two reconciled when they come into conflict? For example, if an employee of a state-owned company ends up being the owner of a small industry, would the people higher ranked compared to him in the state organization take a tax on him or take a bribe to let him continue? Or would they be even employed by him? How does it work? Uh, first of all, of course, they can be easily employed by him. But in this case, you cannot distinguish whether it's real employment or bribing them. Because he can employ them and pay them unnecessarily high wages. But usually, as a rule, if somebody works in the private industry, it doesn't matter whether he or she is an entrepreneur or just a humble worker. It's usually expected that such a person would make donation to the factory to which he or she officially belongs. It's called uh, the 3rd of August money, and the size of donation varies greatly, uh, depending on your salary, on your position, the type of your business. I would like to emphasize that we are not talking about bribes. These donations are perfectly, completely legal, and it's not that they go to the pockets of the officials, they go to the budget, budget of this particular factory. However, as I have said, until recently, until a few years ago, it was a bit difficult to buy such a freedom to be engaged with the private market, because the government wanted every worker to attend his or her workplace, even if there was virtually nothing to do there because nothing was operation. It's not the case anymore, and hence my understanding is that in the recent years it has become possible to do some work in the private economy without paying this 3rd of August contribution money. But I'm not so sure about it. Um, maybe in most cases you still have to pay. In some cases you def definitely have to pay, even now, especially if you are running a large business but officially you are just a humble high school teacher well, your high school will expect to be rewarded for this. 
While we see this creeping marketization at the bottom level, at the state level, North Korea is more isolated than ever. How much of the regime's isolationist and anti-capitalist rhetoric is genuine, and how much of it is hypocrisy? Despite sanctions, North Korea still seems to import billions worth of luxury goods every year. Wow, this question, there are many points I would like to be more specific about. Probably let's divide it into three questions. First is about North Korea's isolation, second about how sincere their slogans are, and third about billions of dollars of their luxury goods which are imported. Let's start from isolation. Frankly, I'm afraid that the remark that North Korea is more isolated than ever is a cliché, and rather misleading one. Uh, because North Korea now, in 2016, is less isolated than pretty much at any point of the last 20 years. Actually, China, after a few years of very frosty, almost hostile relations, uh, the Chinese leadership finally changed their mind and now began to support North Korea on some scale. It remains to be seen how large and enduring the Chinese support will be. Nonetheless, China is back in the game, and even the recent nuclear test did not change much. Second, Russia, which for a few years, for many years actually, for 20 years, used to ignore North Korea, is trying to engage too. Russian engagement is largely symbolical. Uh, the statements about coming large-scale investment and projects have to be taken with a very large dose of criticism. Nonetheless, politically, Russia is remarkably close to North Korea, closer than at any point over the last 25 years. So I don't see that Korea is isolated, frankly. It's isolated indeed, but less so than, say, 10 years ago. Then, other question, whether its anti-capitalist rhetoric and isolationist rhetoric is sincere. When they are talking about isolation, I believe they are sincere. As a matter of fact, Kim Jong-un seems to understand the threat uh, his father used to not to worry too much about. I'm talking about the threat of the foreign information, about the knowledge of the outside world, which is gradually spreading in North Korea, largely thanks to the DVDs, also thanks to the legal and illegal travel to China. North Koreans now are much more aware about the outside world than, say, 15 or let alone 30 years ago. Late Kim Jong-il did not care about it, but Kim Jong-un does what he can, he cannot do much, but he is trying hard to reduce the interaction between North Korean common people and the outside world. They dramatically increased security on the border, and as a result, the number of the refugees who are coming to China from North Korea decreased significantly. The same is true in regard to the North Koreans who arrive to the south as asylum seekers, so called Halbukja. Their numbers are roughly half of what it used to be a few years ago, half. There are many reasons. One of the reasons is, of course, improvement of the economic situation. But the major reason is much tougher attitude to the border protection. So isolation is vital because Kim Jong-un understands only as long as he is capable of keeping his country isolated, as long as he is capable of keeping his people more or less ignorant about the outside world, he has chances to stay in power. Because in a divided country, the spread of information about the outside world, especially South Korea, is deeply destabilizing. Talking about anti-capitalist rhetoric, it does exist, but it's not very common. If you read exactly what is written in the North Korean media nowadays. There are attacks on the capitalism, but essentially the official ideology emphasizes not anti-capitalist nature of the government, it's mentioned but not too frequently, but it's national, pure national spirit. So the message is not anti-capitalism, the message is patriotism. We are the world's best nation, and talking about South Korea, they have been basically corrupted by the Westerners, they are not exactly pure Koreans, and Koreans are great and we are pure Koreans. Something like that. Capitalism is mentioned, but not too much. Then, remark about consumption goods. First of all, I am very skeptical when you said billions of dollars. 
uh, a bit difficult because the entire North Korea trade is around 10 billion US dollars and we are talking trade volume. And I can assure you that most of the items which are imported by the North Koreans is not Hennessy cognac. They largely import oil, food, some components for their military program, and only then luxury goods. So probably we are talking, of course, not billions. Well, a few 10 million, maybe even a few hundred million, hardly more. Having said that, yes, they are importing it and they will do it, but I would not pay much attention to it. I simply don't understand why people are talking about that much. Well, I sort of understand. I see the logic, but it's simply a kind of logic which is not applicable to North Korea. There is a common assumption that the dictator, in order to keep his position, sometimes here, but usually it's a male's job, so let's say him, dictator has to essentially bribe people around him by providing them all kinds of giveaways, money, luxury goods, everything. So the logic is that Kim Jong-un is importing this, you know, Hennessy cognac and BMW cars to give it to high officials, so officials will love him. Otherwise, they will not love him, they might consider a conspiracy. I have to say, well, funny logic. Cannot agree completely, cannot agree. Uh, Because such logic would work in a country which does not face a threat to its existence. I can imagine that somewhere in, say, Latin America of the 1970s, such logic would work. And if the top elite is not getting enough from a particular dictator, they probably would consider replacing the person with somebody else. But it's not the case in North Korea. Even if the top North Korean leaders are not getting their, you know, rations of Hennessy cognac, they are not going to start a conspiracy. And if they do, it will not be because of Hennessy cognac shortages. Because they understand, if they start fighting between themselves, they risk to trigger a massive disintegration of the state. Uh, the assumption is that in order not to be hanged separately, they have to hang together, and they know it. So the absence of their luxury goods in their homes, it's not a big deal, not a big deal. But once again, you are right, yes, they do buy luxury goods, largely in China, and they move it across the border. But if it becomes impossible, it will not have any significant political impact, I would say. You just mentioned some of the imports that North Korea has, but isn't it under sanctions? Well, military equipment is definitely under sanctions. Oil is definitely not. Food is definitely not. Luxury items, it depends on your definition. In some cases they are, in some cases they are not. So is it a fair assessment to say that sanctions have thus far not worked against North Korea. Yes, it is, and I believe it to be a good news. Uh, The sanctions don't work, partially because they are rather modest, partially because China is not willing to be an active participant. And since China controls, say, three quarters of North Korea's foreign trade, its reluctance to participate is vital. Having said that, however, there are other reasons Let's imagine that by some miracle, it's completely impossible. China decides to join the sanctions. If China makes a decision, sanctions might be deadly efficient. If so, what will happen? In most countries which are subjected to the international sanctions, sanctions don't work directly. The immediate result is the deterioration of the living conditions for a majority of the population. Once it happens, People become unhappy and began to press the government, demanding to change the policy which created these economic troubles. If we are talking about a democracy, and let's not forget that many countries which have been subjected to the international sanctions were sort of democratic, at least had regular elections. So if we are talking about democracy, people will vote against the government. If we are talking about authoritarian regime, they might start a revolution. But In North Korea, it's not the case. If sanctions happen, the economy will go really belly up. Even a massive starvation is possible. People will starve to death, but they are not going to vote Kim family out of the government. Because, as you know, they don't vote, or rather vote, with predictable 100% approval rate. 100.0% approval rate. Every single person votes for the government candidate. A revolution, well, may be possible, but not before many people, maybe quarter million, maybe half million, starve to death. 
And even then, I would not bet on a North Korean revolution. Possible, but not very likely. So the question is, are sanctions a good idea? If they are efficient, they will kill a lot of people and maybe, just maybe, eventually bring a regime down. If they are not efficient, these people are alive. It's not a difficult to judge. Of course, sanctions are not a good idea, and I'm sort of happy that due to the Chinese sabotage, sanctions are not going to take off. Recently, it is commonly heard that the relationship between China and North Korea is worsening, mainly because of North Korea's successive nuclear attempts. Do you agree with that assessment? I completely disagree with this assessment. It's an outdated view. I just came from China, early January, talked to a lot of knowledgeable people. Uh, Basically what happened? Looks like that at certain point in August or September, the Chinese decided to dramatically change their North Korean policy. Indeed, from say 2012 and especially 2013 and until late last year, relations between North Korea and China were very tense, frosty. But then things took a sudden turn. The reasons are easy to learn, easy to see when you talk to the Chinese. For China, the single most important factor in the decision making is the United States. The growing rivalry with the United States, the problem in the southern Chinese Sea, which Chinese tend to see as American provocations. Having said that, their attitude to North Korea changed again. Essentially, I would say that the Chinese attitude to North Korea went back to the normal. The period of frosty relations was an aberration. China, both decision makers and the common public, despise North Korea. Chinese cannot stand its ideology. They see them probably more hostile than uh, citizens of any other country see North Korea. Nonetheless, it's irrelevant. The policy, especially the policy of the great powers, is not driven by emotions and is seldom driven by the ideology. It's an old, good Machiavellian vault of calculations. And from the Chinese point of view, nuclear but stable North Korea, which creates a buffer zone, is a lesser evil than collapsing or unstable North Korea. Therefore, China does not want success of North Korean nuclear program. But they are not going to exercise too much pressure on North Korea, since this pressure is likely to basically backfire. They don't want to take measures which might put North Korean stability, internal domestic stability under threat. And no other measure, no other set of measures is likely to succeed. If you want to influence North Korea, you have to hit it hard. But China doesn't want to hit North Korea hard, because if a massive crisis is going to erupt in the Korean Peninsula, China will suffer more than any other country. And it will be blamed, as a matter of fact, for everything. If they don't take refugees, they will be blamed. If they take refugees but don't treat them in a proper way, they will be blamed. If they treat them in proper way but something else goes wrong, they also will be blamed. Plus the threat of proliferation and above all, the threat of an emergence of a unified and generally pro-American, democratic and nationalistic government on the Korean Peninsula. So Chinese are not happy about it. And after a few years, when relations with the United States were not that good, but not disastrously bad. They did toy with the idea of, you know, pushing North Korea hard, but now they have changed their mind. And I can basically say that it happened around, say, August, September 2015. I would probably speculate that it was a decision made on the highest level, definitely in presence of Comrade Xi Jinping. Uh, But at any rate, Uh, What you have mentioned, these frosty relations are over. Uh, For a brief while I thought that the nuclear test uh, would probably change the situation. But my trip to China immediately after the nuclear test and my talk to the Chinese demonstrated clearly, no, it's not the case. Of course China will probably vote, almost definitely vote, for a new set of tougher sanctions in the UN Security Council. 
vote, but at the same time the Chinese diplomats will be working very hard to water it down, to make sure that the toughness will remain symbolical, that the new set of sanctions will be tougher than earlier set, but just, just a little. Because they don't want to put North Korea under much pressure, they need a stable and divided Korean Peninsula. In the ideal world, China would probably like to see a stable, divided and non-nuclear Korean Peninsula. But when it comes to the nuclear issue, China can make compromise. Last fall you published an opinion piece on Al Jazeera's website entitled If China had to choose, it would be South Korea. Do you feel that, since China is now communist in name only, so to speak, North Korea has become really more of a liability beyond its geopolitical interests? Not anymore. Uh, do you remember when I wrote this piece? I wrote it before this dramatic reversal of the Chinese policy in basically, say, September last year. Back then it was true. For a brief while, for a period from, say, February 2013 to, say, August or September 2015, two and a half years, it did appear as if China was going to jeopardize North Korea and try to basically put more attention to the South and get South Korea into the Chinese sphere of influence. But things changed. And things changed largely because of the increasing confrontation with the United States and the crisis in the South Chinese Sea. Chinese now and the belief that at the end of the day, South Korea, for the time being, is an ally of the United States. For China, it's vital that South Korea is likely to accept, not certain, but likely to accept the ATHWAD system. And, uh, of course, it's important that North Korea, sorry, the South Korea uh, has large American military presence. So now when relations with United States are so tense. In the end of the day, China is not going to make serious concessions to South Korea on the North Korean issue. Of course, it doesn't cancel the basic fact. China tends to see the entire East Asia, the former Sinocentric world, as its legal, lawful sphere of influence. Well, pretty much like people in the United States see, say, Central America. And they're not going to be happy about any other forces, any other country to be present there, any more than Americans were happy about, say, Soviet influence in Cuba in the 60s, 70s. So they are likely to gradually continue their policy aimed at, if possible, including the entire Korean Peninsula into the Chinese sphere of influence. However, for the time being, under the new policies, which are still, well, you uh, might be revised, of course, but I don't see any se- signs of that. China is actually back to its attitude. They feel much more sympathy towards South Korea on the ideological and personal level, but it's strategy which matters. Not emotions, not ideological sympathies. And strategy tells clearly, support North Korea, at least prevent a massive crisis in North Korea. It does serve Chinese interest. When dealing with China, does North Korea, and especially Kim Jong-un, have any real power? Well, it has. As long as he stays in control of his country, China faces less trouble in Northeast Asia. He cannot press China. Uh, But China has interest in maintaining his country, in supporting his country's existence. And this is enough. And, of course, Kim Jong-un, like his father and like his grandfather, is not going to bow to the pressure of the great powers, be it China, Russia, United States, name it. So when Chinese demand something, promising some economic rewards, he is quite likely to say no, if he believes that the Chinese idea is somehow dangerous for him staying in power, staying in control. And China can do pretty much nothing about it. So this is the situation. This is the situation. And basically talking about the United States, he usually, and especially his father, uh, used to apply the same policy when they needed something from the United States. Uh, They began to build up pressure. 
uh, nuclear tests, uh, bellicose statements, uh, missile launches, to create a sense of the crisis. And then they essentially demanded to be paid for their willingness to solve the crisis they themselves created in the first place. This policy did work occasionally. It seems it's not working anymore. Uh, because the major attitude in the United States is, well, let's ignore them. The basic approach is that North Korea does not constitute any significant problem. As long as they don't have delivery system, they does not even constitute a serious military threat, so it should be ignored. Uh, so right now these old tricks don't work, but but at the same time at the same time, Kim Jong Un is not going to accept proposals from China or United States if these proposals, no matter how beneficent economically, if these proposals are somehow dangerous for his power for the regime stability. In our prior interview, you mentioned that Kim Jong Il's goal in life was to die before the end of his regime, and he succeeded. Does health play also a big part in Kim Jong-un's life? Specifically, the media keep reporting that he's overweight, that he drinks and smokes too much, that he has problems with his leg, maybe even gout. Should we dismiss all this as tabloid journalism? Or is there more to this? And especially, might this even be politically relevant? Uh, we don't know anything about his health, but it's quite clear that he is seriously overweight and he is getting weight with amazing speed, getting fatter and fatter and fatter, which is, I would say, not good. Uh, second, it's quite clear that he is a heavy smoker and everything else is probably speculations. And of course, if Kim Jong-un drops dead or if he is basically in a seriously bad conditions. It will have tremendous political consequences for the country, where essentially everything depends so much on just one person. So I would say that, well, he is probably not very healthy for his age, but he's in the age when people tend to be healthy, as a matter of fact. So to be unhealthy for somebody in early 30s is not that bad. And then he he's too important personally us to ignore his health issues as politically irrelevant. Nonetheless, the reliable information about his health are difficult to get. Earlier, you mentioned that as a leader, he was brutal. We've had discussions of perjures, some that were revealed to be true, such as Zhang Song Tech, his uncle, but also some that were less reliable, let's say, such as his girlfriend that eventually reappeared a few months later. Why were Purges so predominant in his early career? Partially because of his personal character, I would say, and partially because he is young and wants to show that he is somebody to be taken seriously. In spite of his age, in spite of his looks, he should be taken seriously. He should be feared. And he wants to basically deliver this message to everybody who matters. So it's a policy of, you know, a young leader strangely young, unbelievably young by the North Korean standards, who has to manage people, people who can easily be his fathers or even grandfathers. So in order to be taken seriously, he tends to be very repressive. He just basically wants to be feared. And it makes sense. It makes sense. And of course, his personal character is also important. A common theory is that those purges were there to consolidate his power and eliminate those who might have opposed him. Do you agree? And what are the clans of factions that are now in control in Pyongyang? Well, it's a type of questions I hate. Because there is no shortage in supply of people who are willing to talk about clans and groups, you know, the technocrats, the police, the military. I don't buy it. Groups exist. But we know very little. Essentially, we know nothing about the ex existence of these groups about the membership, about everything. The top North Korean leadership is essentially a black box. We don't know what's going inside. Some people pretend they do, but I'm very, very skeptical. Maybe, just maybe, some intelligence services have penetrated the inner circle, but they are not going to share their discoveries with the common public. And when, say, journalists speculate about some dismissals and purges and everything, 
and they mention all these groups and clans and cliques which allegedly exist in Pyongyang. Well, some of them might exist indeed, and some of these rumors might be indeed correct, but it's virtually impossible to distinguish, to discriminate between fantasies and the real facts. So personally, when people are talking about clans, everything I simply don't join. You wrote that there are constant rivalries between different branches of the North Korean government. Could you tell us more? Are there specific rivalries that are especially famous? Well, talking about major rivalries, we can mention, of course, the party and the military. It's sort of clearly distinguishable groups. And it's quite clear that recently Kim Jong-un is favoring the party rather than the military. It's clear. And other things, if you look at how business is done in North Korea, you will be surprised how segmented the North Korean bureaucracy is. In many cases, you have little or no interaction between different government agencies, which is another North Korean problem. And it's a problem of the foreigners who deal with North Korea, because even if you negotiate some deal with somebody, as soon as this person is maybe even promoted, not necessarily removed, promoted, and moves to another position, you have to negotiate everything in you. And sometimes you negotiate some deal with a particular part of the government, and then another part of the government is not happy, and there is a great deal of some kind of uh, institutional rivalry and conflicts you have no clue about, uh, but you end up with your business project being basically stalled or ruined. Usual situation there, unfortunately. How much power does Kim Jong-un actually have today? While he may be his father's son and his grandfather's grandson, many commentators saw his lack of political experience and young age as a handicap that could threaten his grip on power from the start. It's a type of question I cannot answer. Why? Well, you know, he's not calling me every morning complaining about unruly generals and, you know, all these ministers who uh, say yes, uh, marshal, and do everything their way. He doesn't complain to me. Maybe he complains to his wife, I know not, not me. Uh, But being more serious, actually all this type of ideas, who is in control, difficult to say. But what I see, I see a young leader who is changing top military commanders with unprecedented frequency. I see that the average, I would say, political life expectancy for a defense minister is something like seven or eight months. He's changing minister every seven or eight months. Uh, the top generals of somewhat lesser ranks are also changed very frequently. Is it an indication that he is not in control of the military? I don't think so. Because you don't play such games with the generals. Or what is more interesting, the strange games with promotion and demotion. When the same person, while keeping the same official position, is sometimes promoted and then demoted, he is first, say, four-star general, then vice-marshal, then suddenly three-star general, then four-star general again. If you are afraid of the military, you don't play such games with these people because they take such things deadly seriously. Or if you look at the foreign policy, there have been some general policies, there have been some strange cases which can be explained only by peculiarities, peculiar features of Kim Jong-un's biography. Like his meetings with Dennis Rodman. Well, Americans probably tend to believe that everybody in the world cares about their basketball. No, no, no. Nobody outside the United States cares about American basketball. And Dennis Rodman was a complete unknown in North Korea. The only person who has probably heard of his name and obviously liked him was, of course, Kim Jong-un. Because you have to basically be a foreign teenager to know this name. Growing in an English-speaking foreign environment. And so the decision to invite a person was made clearly by Kim Jong-un. You can say it was a small decision. Well, sort of, but not so, because it was very prominent and slightly damaging to the image of the North Korean top leaders. But what about Masik project, Masik ski resort? They invested so much money in. Again, uh, making ski resorts in North Korea doesn't look like a kind of, you know, reasonable policy. And the best explanation for such strange twist is that the decision was made by somebody who spent too much time in Switzerland. Uh, So looking at this indirect evidence, I would say that Kim Jong-un is probably much in control. But once again, we don't know. 
and it might take decades before we will know with any certainty how decisions are now made in Pyongyang. In our previous interview, you mentioned that Kim Jong-il was, and I quote, a closet liberal. Do you think that his son follows the same path? Definitely not. Uh, Kim Jong-il was afraid to touch the economy. But when it came to the political kind of political life, he was indeed much more liberal than we tend to believe. There was a significant decrease in the mess of the system under Kim Jong-il. Uh, he basically turned blind eye to a massive migration to and from China. He essentially did not really seriously try to close the country for the foreign information. Kim Jong-il is different. We don't have yet statistics about the size of the prison camps. So we don't know whether prison camps increased or decreased under Kim Jong-un. But something tells me that there was a relatively small increase in the prison population in North Korea because so many people have been arrested. Most of these people are not commons. Most of these people are elite. We should never forget about it. Uh, Nonetheless, well, I would expect some increase. Then we have these measures uh, against information penetration. Much more control on the border, tougher sentences to the attempting defectors, attempts to punish people who are copying, producing, somehow disseminating the foreign videos. It's also quite new. Uh, So if we look at Kim Jong-un's policy, It seems to be significantly more repressive than policy of his father, probably even more repressive than policy of his grandfather. So he is no closet liberal. He is quite trigger happy, he is quite willing to use violence, he is quite willing to kill people he doesn't like. Most recently, North Korea has made news with yet another test of nuclear bomb, an alleged hydrogen bomb. Do you see that aimed at domestic audiences or rather at foreign audiences? Domestic audiences, definitely, because foreign audiences was bound to learn in no time that it was a lie, that it was not a hydrogen bomb or thermonuclear device. Uh, For the domestic audience, it's important, because we have the 7th Congress coming. The 7th Party Congress is scheduled to meet in spring, May this year, and this type of gathering they have not had for 36 years. Hence, the young leader needs something to present. He has to show some success. What can he do? Yet another normal regular nuclear test? Well, he can, but it has happened three times before. To claim that North Korea has successfully launched satellite? Well, has been before too, three times. Only once it was really successful, but success in other cases was claimed anyway. So, a thermonuclear device is a good idea. It sounds like a major advancement of the nuclear missile program. It sounds sufficiently terrifying. People know that it's difficult to do. So he made the claim. And it's not really important that pretty much all North Koreans will soon learn that the Western analysts and engineers (laughs) did not agree. First of all, and above all, they are not necessarily willing to believe the foreign reports on such issue. Because they assume that the foreign reports are basically, you know, censored or distorted in order to play down the greatness of their country. It's a very common view in North Korea. Uh, So even if they learn about uh, these skeptical Western reports, it will not change their mind completely. And many of them will be probably still inclined to believe that the new leader has made a major, another major breakthrough in the military defense industry. So this was the goal. He now he has something to boast about at the coming party congress to look that he has made something, you know, prepared something for the congress and did it himself. Uh, not just, you know, took over heritage of his father or grandfather. North Korea's nuclear program has quite a long history. Was there ever a chance for it to change when Kim Jong-un came to power? Or should we rather see it as an essential part of North Korea's raison d'etat? And regardless of who is in power or how much other countries want North Korea to change, it's there to stay. I believe it's there to stay. Uh, Because look at their logic. There was only one strongman in the recent history who agreed to surrender nuclear weapons in exchange for promised economic aid. His name was Gaddafi. Everybody remembers how he died. There was Saddam of Iraq accused of secretly producing weapons of mass destruction. He didn't do it, as we know now. 
but he was overthrown anyway. And as North Korean officials always eager to remind, he was overthrown exactly because he had no nuclear weapons. The North Korean logic is, had Saddam really had nuclear weapons, he would be alive and in power. Same is applicable to Gaddafi. So finally, they saw what happened to Ukraine, which according to 1994 Budapest Protocol, where Russia and some other countries guaranteed Ukrainian territorial integrity in exchange for its willingness to surrender nuclear weapons. Well, you know what happened to the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So all things combined can be seen as one universal lesson. In the modern world, you are not going to be rewarded for your willingness to surrender nukes. Much more likely you are going to be punished for that. It doesn't matter whether Kim Jong un whoever is in control. These people would like to have economic growth and carburation, but it's essentially a secondary goal. Their major goal is political survival. And, as they have learned from the recent history, nuclear weapons is the best way to guarantee such survival. So far we spoke a lot about the regime in Pyongyang, but what about the ordinary citizens of North Korea? Did the majority of them, to your knowledge, experience any significant change in their life since Kim Jong-un came to power? I would say their life has improved significantly. Not dramatically, but significantly. There is some malnutrition, especially in the countryside. But nobody now faces the real risks of starving to death. There is a large number of the new consumption goods, usually imported from China. Even refrigerators at home are not seen as a real luxury item anymore. There is a great deal of cell phones, and old good landline phones are probably in the majority of the urban houses. It began to happen under Kim Jong-il, but the changes accelerated under his son. People who are employed with the private economy, and this is a very large part, probably majority of population, feel much more secure about their employment, because massive campaigns against private enterprises are now a thing of the past. Uh, so we have more car, we have more entertainment. Yes, you face greater risks if you try to cross some kind of red line designed by the government, like, say, watching foreign movies. You face greater risks than a few years ago. But otherwise, life has become slightly more secure and obviously more affluent. And it's not re related to Pyongyang Elan. Same changes you can see in the countryside too. As you say, North Korea is changing, for better or worse. Is the public image of the country lagging behind? And where do you see the biggest misperceptions about North Korea since Kim Jong-un came to power? There are two major perceptions, I would say. One is quite old, another is less so. The old one is that North Korea is an irrational bellicose state who just enjoys making nuclear weapons and can at any moment attack all its neighbors because, you know, it's run by a crazy maniac who has at his disposal hordes of robot-like humans ready to die according to his orders. It's rubbish, but it's very popular. Uh, in real life, North Korea is a highly rational state. They are masters of the political survival. They are brilliant diplomats who are so basically making impossible, really impossible things to happen. They stay in power in spite of all problems. They have outlived nearly all other communist regimes, and this is a major achievement. The second kind of misperception is the idea of a starving North Korea. You know, it's, many people will tell you as a matter of fact, but North Koreans are starving, aren't they? Because they aren't. Uh, there was a massive starvation 15 years ago or a bit more. But right now, as I have said, only malnutrition. For many people, it's not known or basically creates some kind of, you know, unease. When they learn uh, that North Korean economy is growing, the North Korean living standards are improving. In many cases, it's sort of dismissed by the remarks that it must be happening only in Pyongyang. No, it's not only in Pyongyang. But it goes against uh, the common assumption. To conclude, in your opinion, has the life expectancy of North Korea, as we know it, gotten longer or shorter under Kim Jong-un? It appears that he is conducting essentially a dangerous surgery. He is trying to change the country 
in reducing gradual and mild reforms, on the assumption that the reforms will probably generate a sustainable economic growth, so he will make his country into a minor version of China in due time. And he might succeed. But at the same time, at the same time, such reforms are very risky. The decision to do reforms actually significantly increase the probability of regime collapse in the relatively near future, five to ten years. At the same time, if he survives this crisis, this kind of transition period, it's quite possible that he will stay in power for decades. Or basically, like say, in China, in Vietnam, where the Communist Party has been in control under the new regime, kind of essentially capitalist market economy regime, for say 35 years and likely to remain in control quite long. So it's more complicated. Uh, has policy of his father continued, I would say 15 to 20 years, and then probably collapse. With him, now we cannot give such a simplistic answer. On one hand, there is a probability that badly executed reforms will essentially speed up the disintegration of the system. It's possible. Or alternatively, if he succeeds, probably the system will last longer than it will be possible under his father. But of course it will not be exactly North Korea we know now. There will be a great deal of talk about Chuchie, you know, portraits of the Kim family everywhere, uh, stories about the great past and description of everything as Chuchie socialist. Uh, but if you come to the real political system, this country will become even more market, even more capitalist than North Korea now nowadays, and it's pretty capitalist now, uh, maybe even more than China. Professor Andrei Landkov? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.